Um, today I've got the honor to introduce Rachel Kite. Rachel Kite is the CEO of uh, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and she's also the special envoy on sustainable energy to the UN uh, Secretary General. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, it's good to be here. So, Rachel, a lot has been happening over the past couple of years in terms of climate change. Um, we've had COP21, we had this uh, Paris signing agreement um, about two weeks ago at the UN, and then today we've got, uh, we're, we're running the uh, Climate Action 2016 conference. Um, the theme of today's conference is really around implementation. Do you think that's happening so far? Well, so the answer is sort of yes and no. Um, I mean, first of all, I think that last year was all about getting to an agreement, and we, you know, outdid ourselves. Right, we outperformed. The agreement was a lot stronger than I think anybody going in thought was possible. So now, two things have to happen: is that we have to really understand the implications of what we agreed, and that has to now be made real in the plans and policies of governments, in the business plans and products and services of companies and in the way that municipal leaders manage cities etc so now it's the pivot from getting an agreement to making it happen now that so it's early days right but the yes is that there are all kinds of things happening already all around the world as you start to see people investing in what they assume must be the future so if we want to get to below two degrees, way below two degrees, we want to get to 1.5 degrees, then we're talking about having a zero net emissions economy. We're talking about having that zero net emissions economy as soon after 2050 as possible. That means that our economy has to be in balance with the chemistry of the planet. That means that we can't be putting emissions up into the atmosphere if we can't take them out again. And this means that we have to invest in cleaner processes. And there are many reasons for doing that, not just the fact that we need to halt warming, but this is where we get clean air, this is where we get improved children's health, this is where we get competitiveness of firms and cities. So there are lots of development reasons in the short term as well as long term climate reasons why we have to do this. So what we're doing at Sustainable Energy for All is working with all of those who are already on that journey and just asking what do you need that would help you go further faster. And so Al Gore yesterday called uh, climate change the greatest investment opportunity of all time. And, and you're sitting slap bang in the middle of one of the most exciting areas, which is the transition to a renewable energy future. Um, what, in your opinion, is the role of renewable energy? Um, and do you think we'll be able to transition quickly enough to achieve the two degree target or 1.5 degree target? So you're absolutely right, we have to have an energy transition, which means we have to move from an energy system that is uh, predominantly built around fossil fuels today and which does not provide a good service to many, many people at the moment. So it's, it's an energy system that is underperforming and is uh, one that's inconsistent with our climate goals. So there are people who don't have access to power, so there are 1.1 billion people who don't have access to electricity. There are 2.9 billion people who don't have access to clean cooking. Many people who do have access to some, to some form of electricity can't rely upon it. It's only available for a few hours of the day. And you try running a business when you don't know whether the power's coming on or coming off. So we have a complete transformation of a system that we need to undertake. Now, the amazing thing is that the technology means that the price of renewables is just tumbling and renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels in many many different markets what however the economic system does is still tilt itself towards fossil fuels we have 500 billion dollars worth of direct subsidies for fossil fuels in the global economy we don't price the things we want less of um, so we negatively price um, uh, the things we do want. So we, we don't have a price on carbon, so we can't actually incentivize the economy towards the kind of cleaner future that we want. So all of the policies in many countries are sending mixed signals. Yes, we want more renewables, but we're subsidizing non-renewables. 
So if we could get a cleaner, level playing field, there is absolutely no way, no, no reason to believe that renewables couldn't be a much, much, much bigger part of, of the mix. And in countries that have put the right policies in place, where entrepreneurs are driving forward, we already start to see remarkable series of investments in Chile, in Morocco, in South Africa, in India, in China, in Saudi Arabia. The proportion of renewables coming into the mix is really quite astounding. So this can be done um, and must be done, but in that case we just have to be really disciplined and consistent about the messages we're sending into the economy. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really transformational policies, also getting the pricing right. Um, and interesting that you mentioned South Africa and Morocco as, as leading examples of, of where renewables are taking off. Um, looking ahead at COP22, it is taking place in, in Morocco. Um, I was just wondering, what would be the renewable energy and, and sustainable energy for all message that you'd want to get out of that? Is it, is it more of an Africa-orientated message or is it a, a global message around the transition? So I think that the most important message is that there is work to do everywhere. So if you're in a country where you still have 80% of the population without access to energy, then that is a policy priority for you because the economic growth is, just isn't going to come. The health services don't come, the education services don't come without access to electricity. The remarkable innovation in technology means that we don't have to fill that access gap, we don't have to end energy poverty with dirty energy, we can do it with clean energy now but the policy and the finance has to support the technology. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, the question is how can we close the energy access gap? How can we end po energy poverty in a way which helps those economies grow cleanly, be competitive and still come in below two degrees? And that is possible. If I'd said this seven years ago, I wouldn't have had the technological foundation upon which to say it. So I can now, paint a picture for you of what it could look like in 2024. Yeah, I, can, I can imagine being in a small town in central northern Africa. I can, I can imagine uh, being in, in, you know, in a village where the women are all working and the women took the access that they had to clean energy and the time that that freed up for them to become the peace envoys that they needed to be walking village to village and stopping the violence, right? I, I can see that world. I can see a world where in London, you know, we're sitting in a boardroom of a major energy services company and the majority of the board is made up of women. Uh, and the chief financial officer is a woman and the chief sustainability officer is a woman. You know, the energy system of tomorrow will not be the same as today. You'll be getting your power in a distributed fashion. You'll be getting clean power. Different companies will be running the energy sector and they will be more diverse because we know that diverse teams make different decisions than non-diverse teams. It's not that women make different, better decisions than men, it's diverse teams think about risk and opportunity differently. So in Marrakesh, as we move from an agreement to action, what you're going to see SE for All doing is telling the stories of what that action will result in. We, we can imagine the future already and that's important because then people will know what to do on Monday morning. It is possible, this is not fantasy. You'll also see us talking about how everybody can take positive steps for action, how individuals can. If you are a student and you were in part of the divestment movement last year, we're going to be able to tell you where you should not divest from, but where to invest in. And you can invest in that energy future. And the mechanisms for you to be able to do that are under development. And by Marrakesh, we'll be able to show you how to do that. So I think we have to take everybody, every individual, every mayor, every community leader, every elected leader, every CEO, and, and, and push that leadership forward because we just don't have time but to say that we can't imagine what the future looks like and that future isn't a better one than today, that's, we have to lay that to rest. I completely agree and it's, it's amazing to hear such optimism and, and such visualization of the future. Um, I, I had experience with uh, Solar Mamas, it's a documentary where uh, 
impoverished African and, and Middle Eastern ladies are taught to be solar engineers, and they go back and spread peace and electrify their villages and create uh, entrepreneurship. Um, so yes, the, the role of women is going to be a, a guiding force, but also the role of youth. So yeah. I, I, I'd like to hear what is your message for young people out there? Because it is this generation that is feeling the impacts of, of climate change, and it is this generation that has to solve the crisis. So <clears throat> you are heavily vested in this transition working because the good jobs are going to come in that transition. You are heavily vested, therefore, in the decisions being made now that will create the policy environment for those kinds of firms to flourish. You do not want to be graduating high school, graduating college, going into a technical profession for which there is no future. You do not want a low-paying job in an industry that is sunsetting or which is going to be transforming. There will be support for those who must not be left behind in this transition, but you want to be in an economy where we're investing in the firms with the good jobs, and the good jobs are going to be clean jobs, they're going to be the different kinds of jobs. It's going to be in the installation and the maintenance and the distribution and the new business models of new forms of energy. I was just in Iceland, where of course they have a remarkable geothermal capability, an abundant cheap form of energy and an abundant cheap form of heating and a way to diversify industry on this volcanic island in the middle of nowhere. And there in the classrooms were Zambians and Kenyans and Indonesians and Chinese and Hungarians and Romanians and young people from all over the world, many of them women, mastering the geoengineering, the geochemistry, the geophysics, the, the, the mechanical engineering of what it means to capture geothermal energy because what kind of career will that be? That, that's a promising, well-paying, good job for this generation and the next generation. So you have a real interest in making sure that government is taking the barriers out of the way from these industries from growing. You have a real interest in where people are investing now. You may not have a pension now, but you're going to need one sooner or later. And the pension funds that you will participate in, the endowment funds of the universities that you will study in, must be putting their money into safe long-term bets. Because if they're putting money into industries that will not be competitive in a very short pace of time, so if they're investing in what we call stranded assets, your pension is in real trouble. You're a voter. It matters. We are long past denial. This is happening. It's happening now. It doesn't discriminate between red states and blue states. It doesn't matter whether you're a conservative or a liberal. If you're sitting in the eye of a storm, which is more intense than we've ever seen before because of the warmth of the ocean, because of climate change, it won't discriminate. But you do want an elected leader. You want a city council leader. You want a mayor. You want a president. You want a prime minister that gets it that is prepared to look it right in the eye, is prepared to invest in your resilience, and is prepared to invest in your future. It matters. So whether you're a voter, a student, a pension uh, holder, or somebody who will save and have pensions in the future, every aspect of who you are is going to be affected by climate change, and you are vested now. This is not something you'll pick up when you're 35. Don't wait till you have kids. You've got to act now, and you've got to speak out now. I completely agree, we have to act right now. Um, just one more question on sustainable energy. So, sustainable energy comes in many different forms, and I think that's potentially what's so exciting about it. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, solar PV, we hear a lot about wind. Um, my personal favorite is actually concentrating solar power, but what, what other technologies are out there that, that should excite us um, in, in this transition? Well, I, I just I talked about geothermal, and I think that people think that geothermal is a source of 
energy generation, you know, and the ring of fire in countries which have volcanic activity or, or have uh, other geophysical um, uh, arrangements that make it possible. So the Rift Valley, for example, across East Africa. But there's, there's low heat geothermal all over the place. Um, you know, here in Washington DC, the Secretary General went to a middle school yesterday where they're getting the heat for the school from geothermal. Um, uh, across uh, some of the cities of, of northern Western Europe. This is a really cheap way to heat and cool buildings. Building efficiency is one of the big curves that we need to bend if we're going to stay at 1.5. And it's cheap, it's abundant, and it also allows for diversification. I mean, in Iceland, they're now growing algae and other forms of uh, life to make cosmetics from. You know, who knew that Iceland would be competing with Paris for cosmetics? But you know, there's all kinds of diversification. So geothermal is important. Wave technology um, and other forms of energy from the oceans and the seas will be important in Chile and Australia and other places where they're experimenting. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of uh, experiments also with closed loop energy cycles, so the efficiency with the way that we create energy. We have to be really careful about how much water we're using in the energy technologies that we're developing. So, you know, Bill, uh, Bill Gates has said that, you know, within 10 years we'll have discovered a completely new way of producing energy. I don't know if that's true, just from the ones we have now, we can increase uh, uh, our efficiency. And I think the, the one other aspect of this is that many, many poor people are still reliant upon a inefficient, harmful and unproductive use of biomass, of either burning uh, wood or burning other forms of uh, of uh, food stock or food stuff and working out in which circumstances it makes sense to get energy from food and energy from biomass and how to do that efficiently and cleanly is going to be a very important way of helping many of the, the hundreds of millions of Africans and South Asians who don't have access to energy to have access to energy. So the technology is outstripping the policy and the finance and I think that what we've really got to do is understand the point at which the technology is at and be really serious about finding the ways to finance and manage and create the policy environment for those technologies to be available uh, at a much, uh, much broader level than they are at the moment. Well, thank you so much. I think we're very much in a very exciting space in a very exciting time and, and there's a lot of progress and uh, sustainable energy for all is in the midst of it. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you very much.